panel will be discussing the challenges and possibilities of working with the resettled Iraqi refugee population in their transition into the Chicagoland area. So the three um, panelists that we have today are members of local community groups that have worked beyond the resettlement um, agency process to help Iraqis um, adjust into their transition in the U.S. The first speaker with us today is Tom Robb. He is the director of Care for Real, a food pantry and clothing distribution program in Edgewater on the north side in Chicago. Mr. Robb has worked closely with, with refugees since 1991. As a volunteer, he initiated an aggressive community response for wounded and concentration camp victims from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Particip he also participated as the founding president of the Chicago Association for the Lost Boys of Sudan and continues to provide services to refugees from a number of countries. Among other things, he wrote the 501c3 application for the Bosnian Refugee Center, was the director of education and employment with World Relief, and has taught many semesters of ESL courses. He is currently involved in supporting many individuals and families who have recently arrived from Iraq, both as an individual and through the, care, the services of Care for Real. Our second panelist today is Ms. Nazish Yarkhan, who is the founder and director of the Refugee Assistance Programs, a grassroots organization. Uh, she's also an expert in interracial and interfaith initiatives. She's the recipient of the inaugural Muslim Women's Alliance Inspiring Women Award. A writer, editor, Huffing, Huffington Post blogger, and NPR commentator, she has served as a panelist at the Interfaith Youth Court Conference and PBS's Chicago Tonight. Featured on Speaking of Faith, she has been profiled in the Chicago Tribune and other media. Ms. Yarkhan is also the founder of Writers studio and advisory member with Poetry Pals. Since 2003, DuPage County-based um, Refugee Assistance Program, or RAP, has served over 500 refugee families from Iraq, Burma, and Africa, leveraging the solid relationships that it has built with local mosques, churches, schools, and community centers. A Muslim organization, it has become a formidable interfaith force in creating awareness as to the issue, advocating for refugees' rights, and mobilizing communities to help financially. RAP is unique in that it works with input from volunteer refugee leaders, empowers refugees to practice their religion freely, and is funded by donors of all faiths and Islamic organizations. Our final panelist is Ms. Beth Ann Tupin, the Executive Director of the Iraqi Mutual Aid Society. She is also uh, the co-founder. A longtime human rights activist with Amnesty International, she's a former member of Amnesty International's USA Board of Directors and a longtime chair um, of the chair of the Amnesty International's <coughs> Middle East Coordination Group, as well as an Iraq country specialist. The mission of the Iraqi Mutual Aid Society is to foster the well-being and self-sufficiency of Iraqi refugees who have been settled in the Chicago metropolitan area, easing their transition to life in the United States, forging connections between Iraqi and American society, and facilitating the preservation and exchange of Iraqi culture. IMAS provides culturally and linguistically appropriate support services to assist the adjustment to American culture legal and social norms. IMAS helps refugees navigate the complex, complex systems of health, finance, legal and social services, and access education and employment opportunities. And without further ado, we can start the panel off with Mr. Robb. Thank you. Um, I run a food pantry. In our food pantry, uh, you have a graph in front of you, two circles, and I know they're, they're not in color as they started, so they're very hard to read, and I'm sorry for that. But on, the, uh, on your left is January of 2008, when we took care of about 1,200 people, and it broke down ethnicity, and I don't know if you can see if it's clear enough. And then September of 2009, where we are now taking care of 3,200 people every month. Uh, and the impact of Iraqi refugees on our uh, pantry ethnicity breakdown. Uh, it is the largest impact, and we have now hundreds and hundreds of Iraqis who come to us every month for their food. And uh, all of the people in that article also come to our pantry. And I, I want to I reinforce something that was said by uh, both uh, Dr. Silverman and, and uh, Greg Wangren, was that the, uh, the author of that article talked to me for an hour and a half and nothing I said showed up. Uh, <laughs> and part of that is because I believe that we, 
and I don't care if you're lawyers or if you're professors or if you're pushing a broom, all of us can make life better for the persons that come here from other countries. Mm -hmm. And we can do it by getting to know them. Now, many of the Iraqis sitting in the room today were also in my backyard last summer. We had about 60, and I think there were only about 80 in town then, so we were able to have something to get started with. Uh, but from that, there are seven private schools that have endorsed, found scholarships and so on for the children of many of these families. We have a number of other stories to tell, great stories to tell. Among all those stories, however, Jossim, who works as a volunteer in my pantry in order to meet the public aid requirement of 20 hours a week in order to stay in public aid, was told by his caseworker that she didn't believe him anymore and that he should have gotten a job by now and would, she would recommend him being dropped. This was last week, so on Monday we found out he was dropped. On Tuesday we found out that another woman, also in that article, was evicted. We helped her move to a new apartment. Uh, the point is that the stories are, they're real, but the other part of the story is that there's a whole community out here that needs to be engaged in participation with all the refugees, all of them. And it isn't mean the comfortable ones. Now, anybody who knows Fatima knows that the first thing you know about Fatima is that she's going to tell you what's on her mind right now. Uh, this one, my father. <laughs> if you're not ready to hear it, get out of the room. And then you'll find that she's a wonderful, caring, warm person who is somebody who is caring for others as well as in need of your caring as well. Uh, the kinds of problems are so immense to the individual. And for those of us who have been too many years in the business, uh, I started by, as a member of a church, that in one year we took care of about 300 heavily wounded refugees out of Bosnia. And after that it just kept happening. Ed Silverman has had to put up with me for a long time, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but I think what I say is true, that the community is the answer. The agencies are the vehicle that has a requirement. I don't have to worry about whether these people are healthy. Greg Wangren does. I don't have to worry about whether everything is set in their apartments. But guess what? I've had agencies drop by my office for clothes, pillows, and blankets on their way from the airport to the first appearance at the apartment. And that's wrong. And that's something that needs to be addressed. Not just, I don't want to make this a deal on this, but that's where all of us need to be reflecting on ourselves. I wish I could give more food to the people that come into my agency. The only reason they're there is because they're poor and they're hungry. I don't ask them if they qualify by being something besides poor and hungry. As it turns out, we have quite a broad spectrum of, of uh, people from all over the world that come to us, from all ages, and we have to help them. Now our help is lucky. We have lots of linguistic capacity in our agency. We have less than 5% government money, which means I have lots of freedom to do things the way I want, and uh, that helps a lot. Uh, but I, I would look to all of you and say, understand that the refugee coming here has nothing to say about it. They're plopped here. And while we may watch well-known, high-level people on television being paid big bucks to get up and denigrate refugees, immigrants, and all others from other countries while they promise America is the only great place. Our job is to see to it that the people that come here are met, find out that they can make it, and it's up to us to find out what will help them make what they want out of their life. I want to reflect on the first refugee I helped was from Russia in 1991. He had three PhDs. He was professor of physics in uh, Odessa. And we went to Northwestern to meet with the engineering department and the young 
fellow at Cross from us, says, well, now what do you want to do in the next five years? And my friend looked at him and in perfect English said, I want to raise my son in America. What is this to do with anything? He already had his published articles in the Northwestern Library, but he was being treated not as an individual who came as a professional to be discussed a future and a promise, but as somebody who was going to be treated like someone not quite a part of the new community. Since then, he's done quite well. He rewrote the international forecasting program for the Mercantile Exchange, and um, he and his wife and the son he raised are doing quite well. The promise is there, and what I hope all of us can go away from this kind of program, besides understanding how hard it is, Fatima never sees me stop saying, you'll make it, because you will. And the same for Nazim, and the same for the rest here. We all can make it, and we can make it together. Will we make something happen that makes their future look like their past? Probably not. But I can tell you I personally helped write the personal statements for 18 young doctors from Bosnia who are practicing medicine now. When they were told by their agencies they should really get into the taxicab business. So I, I want to say promise is there and it's really up to us. It's up to every one of us. You think the Sudanese boys didn't know how to open the car door of my car at the airport because they'd never stepped inside an automobile. And they're graduating from university now. And they're sending back and building, building schools in their hometowns in Sudan. And what I'm saying is not me, it's just all of you. All of you. Know your churches, know your community organizations. Heavens, this is a university. Why don't we have a club here, sponsor a family, call up Greg Wangren and said, how do I help? And he'll put an agency together and he'll have somebody help make that work. And that's, that's I guess, the biggest message I can give to you. And uh, the apartments, all of this is terribly important. The, but we can make it together. If we look to the government and say, you have to do it for us, then what we're doing is both us and them. We're teaching them that America is two different places. That it's those of us who accidentally happen to have a profession and income and support for ourselves and all of the rest. And I think we've had administrations that have shown us that point of view, and I don't think that's a good point of view. So I'll leave that political statement alone. But please understand that is there are people, and it only will take you, sometimes you can get by with a half an hour a week, and you can make the difference to a whole family. And if you put in a couple hours, think how many more families you can touch. That's, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Nazish, and I'm from Refugee Assistance Programs. And just like Rob said, what I began doing, I have children who are in elementary school. I had a kindergartner. And I was dropping my daughter to school, and there were these uh, African women with thin clothes. They were wearing thin <coughs> cotton clothes. It was cold. It was winter. They were wearing sandals. And I could have given them some money. I knew instinctively that they were Muslim, because I'm Muslim, and I know Muslim women cover their hair, by and large. And I could have given her some money and walked away, but that wasn't what I did. I got involved in their lives, and in, through the PTA, we started a group called Community Outreach, where the school, we had 65 refugee kids in our school that year. And the school would raise supplies, book, uh, breakfast, what have you, winter clothes, what have you. Although all the refugees were resettled by World Relief. And this is not to knock the refugee resettlement agencies, but there is only so much that they do, because they tend to be understaffed and um, underfinanced. And I don't feel that they push back enough, although Greg said to me that they do. You know, I say, if you have a problem with the government, they're not giving you enough money, well, scream and shout, do something about it. Um, and that's how we began. We began very, very grassroots. It was just mothers, and I got the entire community mobilized because I'd send out emails and say, well, I need to pay so-and-so's rent. And the main obstacle we faced was that we wouldn't get the information from the agency. They'd say, well, you know, it's confidentiality. We can't tell you. It's happened so that they lived in my backyard. They were in the same school district that my daughter was. So it was very easy to get involved. 
And I'll, I'll just give you a big picture overview. The Iraqis, by and large, are urban people. They will settle, although it's really, really hard. And like Tom said, you, we need to help them make it. When the Sudanese came, they were rural. We had to go in and say, well, and it's, we is very few. We, you could count on your fingers on you know, one or two hands. And it's not like thousands of volunteers. We'd go in and say, well, this is where you put the stamp on the envelope so that you can mail it. This is how the envelope, the address should go through that plastic window so that it actually reaches. It was hours and hours of this. And then we also had to overcome psychological barriers mm -hmm. because we'd like, why don't you get two jobs? And they'd be not willing to get two jobs to feed their eight children. And we had to understand that they were happy that they were not being shot at, that their women were not being raped. So if they had one job, it was something sufficient. So we had to take, up, take out our mentality from the equation and not put our standards, especially being Indian, we have very high standards. You have to be a go-getter or you know, we say, what's wrong with you? So that's a big part of it. And then we tried to work with um, the resettlement agencies, and we found that they were not that welcoming because we're not, uh, we didn't fall under their, uh, we, they worked mostly with Christians and church organizations. Mm -hmm. So that's my big, big picture now that we've become an organization is that we need them to work with us because we're willing to do it. We're willing to fund people. M most recently, we paid $2,800 in rent for someone. We've done this work for six years. And it wasn't just love and fresh air and prayers. It was pounding the pavement and asking for donations. And people will give donations. We had a gentleman, especially now that the Iraqis, there's so many who are professionals. We paid for a gentleman to get the USMLE books. And they're expensive. USMLE is what they take when you're a physician and you want to go back to being a doctor in the US. So we had people donate those books. We bought some of the equipment, although there's so many doctors in the Indian Pakistani community, I don't know why they didn't just donate a stethoscope, but they just <laughs> wanted to give us the money. So we bought that on Amazon, sent it to him, and he passed USMLE step two, and now he's looking for residencies. So it's, it's just the ma a matter of being conscious that you can make a difference, of being aware that uh, it is your responsibility, especially if you are a human being. And even if you're a person of faith, you know, it's faith in action. That's what makes your faith what it is. Like, which faith says, go, let your neighbor be hungry? I don't think anyone does. And if I could do it with two small children in the house, anyone can do it. And, um, you know, I have to be lucky. I'm lucky that, yes, my husband didn't say, well, we need a bigger house, go get a job. You know, I was raising the kids, and this is what I did in my spare time, and it was important. So that's basically one part of it. The other part of it is we have to advocate for policy change. Yes. D driving lessons cost $60 an hour. It's expensive for me, let alone someone who doesn't have money. And then you want them to be able to drive to a job. Okay, so we have to be involved in the political system. You know, the housing laws, the apartments allow only X number of people to live in an apartment. If you have more than five children, what are you supposed to do? So when the landlords know that they, these people have no choice but to stay in this apartment building because no one will take them eight kids and two adults, they start abusing the system. There are so many cases of bed bugs. It's unbelievable. And I keep going back to the landlord. And I'm going, now I'm going to go to lawyers because I told her, I told the landlady, you know, this needs to be remedied. And she's like, you know, we sprayed it. And, and she said, it's the refugees. They bring it with them. Like, how can there be so many apartments all over the city with bed bugs and all the refugees bringing it? <laughs> and you know, that kind of attitude is because no one is pushing back and saying, well, you know what? I'm going to get a lawyer. I'm going to get Prairie Legal Services involved. I'm going to get CARE involved. Uh, CARE is the Council of American Islamic Relations. And they were very involved in, Som in Minnesota with the Somali refugees who were on shifts, they were working on assembly lines, they were not allowed to take their prayer breaks. So CARE got involved and now they said, okay, you take your prayer breaks and you take a shorter lunch break. So it's doable, but no one wants to listen to the one individual. And you know, um, I hate to say this, but the Iraqis will have it better than the Africans who came here because they're lighter skinned. Mm -hmm. I hate mm -hmm. to say that, mm -hmm. but that is the truth, you know. Um, and then the uh, other part of advocacy is also transportation in the burbs. The, 
the system is awful. Like when the CTA increases the prices, make phone calls and protest. You know, the same thing in the city, in the, in the suburbs, they keep cutting the bus routes. So we have to really look at the population, the demographics. It's no longer white and it's no longer affluent. That's not to say that non-whites are not affluent. You know, there are plenty who are. And this is not about making it a race issue. It's, it's absolutely not. I work with all races and I work with all faith base people. It's just be aware of the reality. It's not as rose-colored as we'd like it to be. And unless we speak up, it's not going to happen. Just that's what we have to know. And um, then the whole thing that I personally like to see is more interaction with the resettlement agencies and the mosques. For instance, we are happy to make out kitchen kits, and we do it. We're doing everything that the resettlement agencies does on a smaller scale. We bring out kitchen kits to the families. We raise winter wear kits. We try and pay for driving lessons. We have a relationship with the driver's ed school. But there's only so much that we're going to apply for our 501c3 this year. But there's only so much we can do, and we're all volunteer-based, and it takes time coordinating it. But, you know, so many people showed up. I wasn't expecting so many people to show up, because I've been to conferences where there are like 10 people in the room. So I have a lot of hope that if so many people want to be engaged, change is possible. Call your senators. Call your congressmen. You have a voice. You know, you have a vote. Use your vote. Uh. I'm Beth Ann Tupin of the Iraqi Mutual Aid Society. Thank you for inviting us here. And I am uh, humbled to be at this table with the two of you who've been at this work much longer than I have and have done so much uh, for not only the Iraqi community, but for refugees over the years. Um, I met Ahlam uh, about two weeks after she arrived here. Um, I've worked with Amnesty International for a long time and the research team there who had worked with her in Syria when they were doing their research um, knew that she had been resettled in Chicago and asked me to check on her to see how she was doing. Um, by that point, there was a pretty regular flow of people who she had known in Syria who were um, showing up at her door, bringing her their bills and their letters and asking her to read them for them and, and trying to get her to explain to them how to work things here and solve problems. Um, that she didn't know how to solve in the United States yet. <laughs> uh, but they were coming and, and asking her to do this. And about five days after I met her, um, she started saying, so when are we going to start an agency? The Iraqis are having such a hard time here. When are we going to start an agency to help the Iraqi people? Um, and I said, how about we try to get you on your feet first um, and, and slow down because um, what was in her apartment when I met her was what is, what is required to be in the apartment. Um, uh, she came through a different agency than, than yours, but they all are to provide basically the same um, essentials uh, for life. And, they, and the resettlement agencies get people into an apartment, which I believe requires at least first and last month rent paid, um, which right there, just being in the building, the money you get from the government, the agencies get from the government is gone. Um, but she had her three beds for the three of them and a card table and three folding chairs and one other chair in the living room and a lamp and a few dishes and uh, something to cook on. And uh, Ahlam was more fortunate than most. She spoke English. She had a wide range of contacts because of all of her work with Westerners in, while in Syria. Um, so there were people showing up. And, um, and, but we saw her apartment and thought, well, this isn't a home yet, and started just and so what I did and a couple other people did, sent out an email to everybody I knew saying, here's the situation. Um, and we need, made a list of what's needed in, in the apartment. And, and people came, showed up with carloads full of stuff, uh, which then meant that she now had an overloaded, crazy mess of an apartment and started giving stuff out to other people uh, that she knew. And that was kind of the start of this. And, and mainly, I tell that story because um, that is probably the basic idea of what we still want to do at CORE, which is when these people arrive new, they do have an agency uh, that is responsible for them. And <laughs> unlike maybe some others, I have no desire to be the resettlement agency because I think you have a huge and thankless job um, and, and are terribly underfunded. Um, however, because the resettlement agencies are overloaded and underfunded, there's plenty that, that we can do 
uh, as volunteers <laughs> or as an organization to supplement what is possible through the resettlement agency. There are five of them in the Chicago area, in Chicago. Um, they do not all provide the same services or the same level of services because uh, they do not all have the same amount of money and they do not all have the same fundraising capacity. Um, so whereas some can provide a lot of extra services, some cannot. Uh, and that money they get from the government is, you know, is really not enough to go around. So we, we have been in touch with um, several of the resettlement agencies. Not, not all have responded, but uh, some have and have started uh, meeting people when they first arrive. Um, Heartland is allowing us to be there when people first arrive. So we have Iraqi families who've been here a few months, uh, now are showing up on that first day with us when they arrive from the airport with a hot Iraqi meal. And then uh, over the next short few days or, or a week, taking them to show them where the Iraqi shops are on Devon. And, and you know, so it's that contact and more than the skills, because the agency can provide that, but it is this notion of providing friends, of providing, uh, providing that human contact, providing somebody who, um, who cares for you, not because it's their job. Um, because among the Iraqi people, I, I have found um, a high degree of distrust of agencies. Um, they have lived in a corrupt society um, their whole lives, the, the corruption of the old government, the new government, I mean, the, you hear constantly total lack of confidence in, in those authorities. Therefore, the people who are trying to help them are also often uh, in their heads another arm of government and the, the presumption is to look for corruption, uh, which is another, another reason that it makes it very hard, to, I think, to do this work. Um, with this group of refugees, because they are they are looking, uh, I think, for corruption sometimes. And when they see a, um, their expectations of life here not met, um, because there are unrealistically high expectations of what life in America will be, um, when those are not met, and when certain basic needs that were provided by their government back home, because they came from a state that provided uh, you know, where people, the idea that you could be, not have a place to live uh, is conceptually very hard <laughs> for, for them to grasp. The idea that you cannot go to college if you don't have the money is hard to grasp. Uh, the idea that, that medical care is not available um, if, you, if you don't have money um, is, is hard to grasp. And, and so, and in a country that is as wealthy as the United States is, uh, it's, I think, hard. Uh, it, they can say the words, but it's not internalized. It's very, it takes a while to grasp that, that all the things that were free at home are not free here, and, and that the government really does provide this little uh, for you. That said, I, I want to reiterate what Tom and, and Greg both said about the Tribune article. Great exposure. We're very grateful that the existence of the Iraqis here in Chicago was noted. I think they did a good job of capturing the frustration and the dashed expectations and, and that aspect. But there is this other half of the story that there are numerous agencies, official and un, that are, are here to, um, to help the Iraqi refugees and all others. Um, so I was glad that Tom and Nasish could be here <laughs> today with me. And I mean, the resettlement agencies have this job to do. Um, and there are, are a number of other sources. They're not always well communicated. Um, and they're not always specific to this population, which is why we wanted to start something that was Iraqi focused. Because um, it's not just a matter of telling them how, you know, what needs to happen here or, or finding a job um, and sending them on interviews. There is something to knowing this culture and knowing what the Iraqi specific barriers are to taking advantage of what is available here. Um, I want to talk briefly just about the jobs thing because when we talk to everybody, you know, and there's a list of all sorts of things that worry them, jobs is right up there. Everybody wants a job. Um, there is resistance because this is a highly educated population and there are a lot of professionals and it takes um, a close brush with eviction probably to really believe that they're going to have to take a job cleaning in a hotel when they've been a surgeon for 20 years. Um, but um, 
but we do have people, we have, we have one member of our board uh, who is, um, I, I look to him and think, how can we duplicate this? Who was not interviewed, he doesn't like to be interviewed, he's a very shy man. Um, he has a master's or a PhD in economics. He was, uh, for a time, the head of agricultural development for the country of Iraq. Um, he uh, worked for the World Bank for a time. Uh, and he worked, he got a job for $7.91 an hour out at O'Hare. He's about my age. Um, he's worked at desks his whole life. He got a job that he spent almost five hours a day getting to and from, from Edgewater, um, working food service for United at O'Hare for the first few weeks loading ice blocks in the freezer. And he was in the freezer all day, and then after that was working in the refrigerator loading the dairy products. And he did it. Mm -hmm. And he did it for months until he found a better job. And, um, and his better job is paying under $30,000 a year for a family of four, but it's moving. And he, and he didn't like it, <laughs> but he did it. And people, and, and part of what we have to do is convince, I, I think part of our job is to help people get on their feet, meet them when they come here, help them turn their, turn their apartment into a home, help them know they're not alone here, but then also to reinforce that's why we want to work closely with the resettlement agencies because I think we have a role to play if we find some people that are trusted by this population to say, no, they're not lying to you. No, this is really what you have to do. This it really is true. These crummy jobs are what you have to start with. It's what everybody starts with. It is not the end of your story. So while you're looking for those first survival jobs, you don't want to forget, and sometimes they are told they need to forget about their past life and what all their other dreams were, and I hope that is not what they're told too often. Because this crummy job that you're starting with now is not the end of your story. It won't be what you're doing five years from now, ten years from now. Keep your eye on that. Not all doctors will be doctors again, but they can try, and those that can't, you can have discussions about alternate career paths. So there's, there's work that can be done. Um, we can use volunteers <laughs> to do any number of things, um, to collect furniture and winter coats and, and help, help get these apartments uh, set up uh, and make them more um, homey than what they walk into, to teach English. We have uh, a lot of moms with kids won't go to the English classes that are available for free. Uh, even if there is child care, they don't want to put their kids in that situation, so we're hoping to find some people who will go and into apartments and get the people from that, the moms from that building to have ESL classes, maybe, um, and, and need, need really people to do that. Um, we want to help people with their resumes and, and do practice interviews. Um, so, so there, there are any number of things we can use uh, volunteers for, um, as, as everyone else here could. Um, so, so there are ways to help. Um, it is not as hopeless as it was painted in the paper. It is every bit as challenging and difficult as painted, but it is not hopeless. And there are, um, as you've seen today, lots of avenues for participating in helping this population and other refugees. And I hope you'll all do something after you leave here today. We have a third. Really we, have, we have about seven minutes for questions. So, I don't think there's questions. I'm sorry, I forget your name. Beth Ann. Beth. Beth Ann? Yeah. What, what amazes me is how you, when you get like, this PhD in agriculture, why does agencies can't team them up with the Department of Agriculture or some economics department? and sort of get them on the slope right away since you already have a marketable education and skill. It just amazes me why they can't be done. Can if you watch them. If I can answer that specific question, because I actually work closely with the gentleman she was talking about, um, I contacted approximately 13 universities and we talked to the different programs that he was interested in. People agreed to come talk with him, no available jobs. Um, told him he could do another PhD, which he really didn't want to do since he's in his, um, I think he's in his 50s, right, or late mm -hmm. 40s. So um, we have the, reached out to, to different. How about the Department of Agriculture? Reached out to them as well, then it hear back. I, if I could break in too, my story about my Russian friend. 
yeah. from Odessa. It was not the universities where he'd come from. He, he published the first book on the application of liquid crystals, and he did it in Russian, and it was translated to English. But they didn't want to talk to him at the physics department, so he went where he could get some money and make a good living, not what he thought he would do. And I think there's... We have to change the way people look at other people in this country. We have to change what's inside the heads of those universities. One of the things that we want to, that we hope to start working on very soon, and again, most of what we're talking about in terms of our work is aspirational at this point, but one of the things that we want to do, and again, while, why it's worthwhile, I think, to have something culturally specific, is to start doing write-ups on uh, education in Iraq, to have, to have papers on the University of Baghdad and, 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 and um, the University of Mosul. And so people know what a degree from, you know, a medical degree from the University of Baghdad, what that means, how people from the region all would want to come to the University of Baghdad. Um, and part of where we're at right now is trying to find out what already exists, because we do not want to reinvent the wheel. There's so many, you know, uh, so many of these uh, resources already available. But, but I, I, I really sh can't speak for the resettlement agencies, but I will. Um, I, I, think, I think you, their caseload is such. I, I, I don't know if it's realistic for you to do that level of, of work. Uh, I mean, you can, you can answer better than I can on, on that, but to do that level of casework on each individual um, case, I don't know if that's a realistic aim for you, given your resources. Although, if you have a personal connection, I'm sure I can mm -hmm. share that with us afterwards. <laughs> we hope to take to the doctors and like please. invite in, in, introduce them to lots of other doctors and see if we can start having mentors and observerships. But, and, and maybe we can, after this event, we can talk personally yeah. if anyone has any personal connections. I, I wish I did. Like I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have a special obligation to these Iraqis in Afghanistan who screwed mm -hmm. this country. And, and I'm not a pro or against war. This is just, we went in there, we broke their countries. We have an obligation. How do you feel about these mm -hmm. wars? Yeah, please. Um, you know, you shared with us your heart and soul, all three of you, and I really appreciate that. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you first. And then I, you know, I was struck by what you were talking about is um, how difficult it is for you to meet the really basic needs. And Beth Ann, when you started talking about how you do the work, you started talking about the psychological needs of people. Mm -hmm. So related, I mean, I wonder how many refugees that you work with are survivors of torture, and I wonder about the particular psychological needs that they have and the resources you have to meet them. I, I'd like to respond to that a little bit. Many years ago, uh, when the Bosnians first started coming, we were all able to be a part of something, and this gentleman here made it happen. And that was the Bosnian Refugee uh, Mental Health Program. And through that program, they were able to surface new ways of treating post-traumatic stress disorder that has been applied now into our own soldiers. So, and, and the, the investigations and the amount of research and technical knowledge that came from that what is astounding to me personally is that that day's passed and now it's a whole new world and nobody seems to understand it. So I'm suggesting to everybody that that be one of the big agenda items. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that we take someone from a bomb event where they walk like a young girl that I work with here from Iraq says on her way to middle school, the day after the first day of bombing, she went by the other middle school and it was children's hair and, I mean, everything horrible, just the worst experiences. And whenever she stops thinking and grinding and working hard, that flashes into her head. And that's the issue that needs treating and serving. And we know how to do it. In fact, he helped make that possible so that we could know how, how to do it here in Illinois and here in Chicago. Terribly important and that hopefully can be repaired and brought forward. Post-traumatic stress, what we used to say in, in, among the Bosnians was the ones who yelled the most about how terrible things were were the ones who hadn't really faced it. The next ones were the ones that really went through it and they didn't talk about it because they couldn't. <laughs> and so 
uh, there's a whole lot of experience yet to unfold in, in a way. This is pretty fresh and hopefully will not give up. And I hope that the universities and the academia takes this on. You know, the legal services and the, all the other counseling services, terribly important, cannot be forgotten. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, I, I, this is just a general comment, and I, and I think what Nadish uh, and what Belfan talked about perfectly hit the issue on the head when it comes to the psychological problems that, that many of the refugees face, especially the ones that are coming from war-torn countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. I was a flight medic in the U.S. Army for five and a half years, and I think about 90% of the patients that I treated over there were, were women and children, mm -hmm. most of whom were, were a preschool and middle school age. And I think when you're coming from, when you're coming from a war-torn environment like Iraq and Afghanistan, you come in here to this to to the U.S. and the U.S. is marketed to them as this promised land, this land of opportunity. And then they come here and they face the reality on the ground that you know it's not like this. You know we don't have universal mm -hmm. health care. We don't have this universal school system that sends you to college once you're finished with your mm -hmm. with high school. And for them, I think, and for many of them, these are these are professionals. And <clears throat> and when you come here and they face with the opportunity that I was adopted here or I have this PhD in economics or physics, and I have to work this $8 an hour job. And for many Americans, we've been working an $8 an hour job. It's a very difficult thing as well. And I, and I think when you're, when you're that busy, when you were that professional, you have to work that that, that makes it all the more difficult, especially when it's a single mother. And as Fatima spoke earlier about her own personal story, she was a professor, she was a journalist, and she lost everything as a result of a war, as a result of an invasion from one country to another. And I think and I think the when we get to deal with that on that very basic of levels, I think that in turn translates into how much better we can help refugees as a whole. Well thank you to this I have one comment please. You know, uh, I, I work with DuPage United, and uh, it's it's part of uh, United for United for Peace and Action and Justice in in the city, and it's called Lake United in Lake County. It's basically grassroots churches, mosques, um, teachers unions, everyone under one umbrella, and then they go and engage the mayors of towns and work on common issues that people bring up. So that's an avenue if people are interested in making policy change and you know advocating. For that may, because a mayor is not going to come and meet you and I, and certainly not going to listen to us. But if 500 of us or 100 of us went and had a town hall type of discussion with him, we'd engage them in a way that would make for change. And that's an avenue to look at. It's called UPAGE, U-P-A-G in, Chica in Chicago, and DuPage United in the, in DuPage and Lake United in Lake County. And the other thing is not to do for people what they can do for themselves. I uh, mm -hmm. once had a, uh, I was telling someone to go, and he's Iraqi, I was telling him to go and interview for a position, and he says to me, well, you know, you come and pick me up. And I said, no, I can't, I have something going on. So he said, I can't get there. I said, I'll give you directions, you'll get there. And he says, okay, I'll Google it. And we had provided him a car also. So I said, we gave you a car, you had access to an internet, you know how to Google it. So why did you want me to come and pick you? And that's the thing you have to also remember when you're doing work with <laughs> refugees. And I always tell Elham, don't do for the other refugees what they can do for themselves. Don't run ragged. And I think mm -hmm. there's such a huge psychological dimension. All the people are different from each other. Burmese are so industrious and so res resourceful. In three years, they've set up schools, registered schools in Indiana, in three years. <laughs> you look at them, they're so ragtag and thin and small. But you know, I think that's the flip side that we haven't really discussed is the psychological. <laughs> People come with such different personalities and you really have to say, well, you know, you have to set boundaries. Thank you for having us. Thank you Thanks so much for this panel. That was great. <laughs>